Thank you, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks to the facilitator. Um, I, I, I thought I should preface my input with uh, an indication that in the multilateral system of governance and the UN systems, local government is generally classified as a civil society. <laughs> Whilst we continue to fight in those forums, I'm quite comfortable today to kind of wear the civil society hat. But just in case I don't succeed with the civil society hat, my profile indicates that I come from the Soviet Youth Congress, South African Youth Congress, the NC Youth League, and therefore the license that comes with being a youth leaguer, <laughs> even though one might have uh, slightly outgrown. I, I suppose I'm saying this because, in fact, I think the discussion about developmental state needs to be contrasted with what, in fact, we have been doing and ask ourselves the question whether what we have built over the past 20 years has been a developmental state as opposed to a barbarian sort of bureaucratic state that is stuck within the framework of looking at bureaucratic indicators. And think about it when you look at how government is performing and how we judge government ourselves in the country. In many instances, the indicators are what we tend to ask about the performance of departments, what SCOPA is worried about, uh, the Auditor General's report, expenditure levels, uh, and all sorts of bureaucratic indicators. And we don't spend enough time, at least in my opinion, evaluating ourselves from the point of view of developmental indicators. So the, the contrast really and the question I'm asking is whether as we debate the notion of a developmental state, isn't there a contrast in there in terms of what we have designed and the output of what we have designed and how we measure ourselves? Now I'm not going to spend time taking us through the background to the evolution of the developmental state, the developmental state, the theoretical framework. And I'm sure this would be published so we can make that available to say, look, these are the key characteristics of a developmental state. Safe to say that it has a number of critical characteristics amongst those is that it is deliberate in its action. It's able to identify specific outputs. Some, in fact, go as far as saying that it is a collusion of the elites between the political, bureaucratic, business, and institutional elites that tend to meet and have a revolving door uh, that ensures that they are able to deploy resources in a manner that achieves particular outputs. So there are very many different definitions of the developmental state. <clears throat> but the emphasis being that uh, it does a number, <clears throat> excuse me, it does the things that enable us to achieve higher economic growth. It is focused on people. As you bring it closer to home, it tends to then be biased in the redistributive elements of what needs to be done. How do we address the injustices of the past? So not only is its task about the, the, the responsibilities going forward, but it also needs to deal with the redistributive elements. Allow me to say that <clears throat> even the ANC itself has somewhat given a developmental state its own definition, some would argue, adapted to South African conditions, but also adapted to kind of not offend those that might feel a bit uncomfortable with a classical definition of the developmental state. And if you go to the NDP itself, uh, uh, and sitting here with panelists and with the members of the commission, I might get myself into trouble considering they speak after me. But reality is that, in fact, when the National Planning Commission introduced the concept of what we should do about the state, the emphasis was on its capability and capacity, a tacit acknowledgement that there might be problems in the capacity of the state. And even in the chapter that deals with the developmental state, the emphasis is on a lot of bureaucratic indicators. It's about dealing with the 
capacity, institutional ability, and so on and so on, and less emphasis is placed, in fact, on the development task. Of course, it does have to relate to uh, the objectives of the NDP, but the emphasis in terms of crafting of the developmental state, I think, is limited um, in the way in which it is articulated, largely because we were probably responding to the realities of, of current day government challenges that has to do with administration, institutional corruption, uh, spending, and those sorts of things that continue to be devil government. And, and I think that as we continue to do that, we lose sight, in fact, sometimes of the nature of institution that we have built, which is really the emphasis that I'd want to place today. And, and allow me to share an anecdote, which might not, which actually is not in the paper itself, to just demonstrate the point. When we in the city of Johannesburg were implementing the bus rapid transit system, there are a number of critical decisions that we made. Amongst those would have been that in fact the emphasis on ownership should be broad based. It should emphasize ownership by those who have been providing mass public transport. And in this regard, the ownership should lie in the hands of the taxi industry. If not as the primary owner, but as the majority owner of the bus rapid transit system. We also made a decision that uh, the PRT in Johannesburg will start, in fact, in Soweto, with all the complications that come with implementing a system in Soweto, the battles of the taxi industry. And a few deaths away, we were able to implement a bus rapid transit system that, was owned, that is owned by the taxi industry and currently managed by the taxi industry, for that matter. We also made a decision when we implemented phase 1B of the PRT that we will deliberately procure buses at a local level so that, in fact, we begin to spur on local growth and development and begin to incubate industries in bus manufacturing and begin to mobilize our peers and colleagues, particularly in Gauteng, <coughs> specifically Tswane and Ekuruleni, to collaborate in implementing a program where we have local bus manufacturing. But look at how, in fact, as a state, we've judged ourselves. The Auditor General has come back and said that we qualify the city of Johannesburg on the basis that you have not capitalized the PRT that is owned by the taxi industry in your books. So in fact, if you look at it from an accounting treatment point of view, government is saying, we actually are not impressed with the idea that you've given the people ownership of the PRT. That in fact, we are comfortable that you capitalize it in your books because it is designed for single use of the municipality. So we have to make a number of decisions either we capitalize it, and of course, the industry itself would have to capitalize it because they have their own balance sheet to, to publish. So they would capitalize it, and we would capitalize it in our books so that we meet the indicators that government says, actually, these buses belong to you, notwithstanding the fact that they actually belong to the taxi industry. But that's how we charge ourselves. So we've had to conform and change to now meet the accounting treatment requirements that says technically these are our buses even if they don't belong to us. But then we go on further and say, well actually these buses must be manufactured at a local level and made a conscious and deliberate decision that says even if it means that we would not be able to meet our expenditure targets, within the financial year and made the applications to the National Department of Transport that we want to procure the buses locally. This would require rollover of the budget into the next financial year because the local industry needs to build up capacity to meet our requirements. Reality is that we're unable to spend the money in the financial year where the money was allotted. The judgment ultimately was under expenditure by the city of Johannesburg on the PRT. And at no point did anybody say, actually, there's a rider to your annual financial statements that says 
that you are procuring these passes locally so that you can create local jobs. So the argument, at least from my point of view, is that what we've tended to do is rather measure ourselves against administrative and bureaucratic indicators and place less emphasis on the development objectives and indicators and how we judge ourselves and the instruments of, of review judge us is based on those indicators. Therefore, I would want to argue that there are a number of critical things that we need to do in terms of how we redesign our legislative, financial, fiscal, and other instruments and mechanisms of moral suasion to enable the state to be more developmental so that we begin judging the state from a development point of view as opposed to judging it simply from a bureaucratic point of view. Not because we shouldn't worry about expenditure, about accountability, and, and, and. We should worry about those things, but the task is much bigger than, in fact, those things. And, in fact, we should have legislation that enables as opposed to stifles the ability. And I can go on with many examples. It's easier to build houses for the poor in the periphery, in the middle of nowhere, and reinforce apartheid spatial patterns than it is to confront the reality of our morphology as apartheid cities and apartheid designed cities that excludes poor black people from the urban amenity and locks them in dormitory townships. So our history in the past 20 years has been to build RDP houses in the middle of nowhere. And I'm sure Fervour doesn't think that what that we're doing particularly bad in terms of reinforcing what his ideas are. But our subsidies are designed for that. So that's how the system works. Now, I've got in the paper itself a few examples of what we could and should do to drive a developmental state, but because I've run out of time, I won't go through them. Safe to share one that I think is critical, partly because I am a local government practitioner, I am an urban practitioner from the point of view of having been in the city of Johannesburg for Pascal. I've even forgotten that you are our city manager. That's how long I've been in the system. <laughs> <laughs> so, so reality is confronting the Reality of the apartheid city has to do with conf confronting its morphology, its structure, its system, how it works. And for you to be able to do that, you need to build a different city that integrates people into, into the city. That does a number of things, and I'll just make two examples and then two examples, nothing more than that. The first is, is our transport subsidy system designed to enable those who live in the peripheral margins of our cities? Does it enable them to access the city? Our transport subsidy system is designed like any classical transport subsidy system that says, the further you live, the more you pay. In fact, we do not want to incentivize you to live far away from town, but reality is that we've designed and located the people far away from town. So we're continuing to marginalize them in the way in which we subsidize the buses themselves. So we could actually change the subsidy system to acknowledge that the poor live in the periphery and therefore we need to, get to give them greater access into the city through mobility and through reliable public transport. Something that we'd have to consider as opposed to conforming to standard practices that say the further you are, the more we disincentivize how you access the city. Because reality is that it's not voluntary suburbanization. It is because our cities are designed as such. The second relates to building a city that enables greater access from the point of view of where the houses and opportunities are in terms of proximity and accessibility. Reality is, <clears throat> If you look at our current housing subsidy systems, if you look at our current town planning systems, including the recently uh, promulgated Spatial and Land Use Management Act, they do not incentivize nor enable municipalities to make the decisions that say we will build the houses in a manner that integrates our cities. They continue to literally force us into an environment where we have to put the people in the periphery and you have to take some difficult decisions from a practitioner's point of view 
to begin to navigate that. And whilst we are attempting to navigate it, realities that were in uncharted territories, we've published in Johannesburg what we call the corridors of freedom, which are high intensity, high density, integrated land use corridors in the core of the city of Johannesburg. The policy has just been adopted. But I can tell you that the instruments at our disposal are not necessarily enabling. So we're going to navigate a very difficult and uh, arduous process of building opportunities for people closer to the city. But the reality is, unless we do that, and un unless we begin forcing legislation to answer these questions, then we're not going to resolve the problems. Thank you very much.